How's everybody doing? Hoping you're having a fantastic day. The long-awaited series is finally here. Ethan and I have been thinking about doing this series for like six months, right, Ethan? Uh, about that, maybe even longer. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been it's been forever. Uh, and as as a note, uh, Ethan's connection is terrible, so I told him to give give me give me like three seconds after he hears me speak before he talks. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this might this might. Be I was told to be the most judicious. I, I told him to be very judicious about uh, his his speaking time, uh, so we're not like talking over each other all the time. But uh, this is the introductory episode, so if we mess it up, uh, it's whatever. Just remember that it only goes up from here, right, Ethan? Absolutely. Okay, so we'll be answering uh, some questions as well. Uh, this is kind of kind of going to be like a chill introductory type thing. But first, um, I wanted to do a little bit of a personal introduction uh, because all of you know who I am. Uh, you know what I do, but very few of you or actually maybe more than I think of you, uh, but probably very few of you know who Ethan is. So Ethan, uh, who are you and why should we care uh, about what you say? Well, you probably shouldn't care about what I say like right. at all. Um, yeah. You should probably, you should probably defer to, you know, the church and the theologians and uh, all the people who actually possess, you know, great wisdom. But um, I'm i uh, I'm a friend of Christians. I, I went to school with him at, uh, RBC or Reformation Bible College. Um, we ended up converting together pretty much through this entire huge process of complicated mess. And um, then I ended up moving up and living with Scott Hahn and went on Pints with Aquinas and all that. So you guys may know me from there. Um, I will have video on in the future. Right now, it's just kind of a kind of a odd circumstance, so I couldn't get it to work. But um, but yeah, I mean, uh, no, no serious reasons why you should listen to any of my opinions, but um, I love to read theology and study it as much as I can. And uh, I'm a you know, Christian. I talk about these things all the time. So hopefully I can contribute some. Yeah, we, we kind of, we kind of go, uh, we, we've been like reading. I remember uh, when, how long ago was it when you first got your copy of De Revelazione? Probably like eight, nine months ago and you came up to visit and we ended up talking about fundamental theology for a very very long time but yes uh fundamental theology i uh, will be getting into exactly what the heck fundamental theology is because a lot of people don't actually like nobody i know um talks about fundamental theology in its proper sense i've seen some people talk about fundamental theology as somehow like a broad general sort of introduction to theology uh but i've never uh seen people speak about fundamental theology in the classical sense and i think it's very helpful um and it's very um, it, it's something which we ought to uh, study as helping with a lot of the problems, I think, uh, that the community of those of you who watch, uh, the type of people that watch uh, these episodes, uh, the type of people who watch my channel, obviously not all of you, but a lot of you, uh, young guys who are interested in theology, uh, fall into a lot of vices, uh, intellectual vices, that would be solved um, by reading fundamental theology. I, I, I think it's so important for that. I also think it's super important for when it comes to discussions with Protestantism. Um, it, it's, it's really, uh, I'm really, really excited is all I'm saying just to, uh, just to do this. Nothing from Ethan. Ethan's quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about I, that. I, saw, I had I, nothing I for you there. I summed up things so judiciously. Now we're we're gonna we're gonna get into that a little yes. bit later. I'm kind of going off of off of outline right now. But yeah, basically, um, that's that's who we are. Uh, but who is uh, who is Reginald Murray Garrigou Lagrange, uh, the man we will be studying? Um, he he is a very uh, beloved. He's actually the guy on my hat right now. I just uh, I just remembered that. Um, he's a guy no on my hat right way. now. Yeah, look, I got a hat. It says the Bishop of Rome hath jurisdiction. I made that. Oh, that is send me one. Yeah, Just I like can... you know, a, a, a freebie for coming on the show. Yeah, I, I'll, I can I can send you a hat. Yeah, there. Uh, basically, I I meant I I was going to put a pope on there. I was going to put like Pope Francis on there because I was trolling the thirty nine articles. 
Um, but the Gary mm. picture where he's looking angry just went so well with the quotes. I put them on there. So a uh, description below, if any of you guys want, uh, there's like hats and magnets and like coffee mugs. And yeah, you can get a lot of different stuff. But basically, who who is Gary Go? Um, so what you have after St. Thomas, all of you guys know about St. Thomas and the first scholastic, the first scholastic period in general. But after the first scholastic period, uh, you'll never believe it, but there, there's what's called the second scholastic period. So the second scholastic period, uh, that's known as the Baroque period. It follows the Council of Trent a little bit before it with certain figures like Cajetan or uh, Ferreira, for example. Um, but what you get is you get people who are following within the school of St. Thomas. Uh, a little, There's some figures during uh, and right after his lifetime that we can call Thomists, but really Thomism. Uh, as a, a philosophical and theological system gets built up by these guys in the second scholastic period uh, by way of commenting, continuing to comment uh, on the works of Aristotle. A uh, Cajetan, for example, completed uh, St. Thomas's commentaries on um, the logical works of Aristotle and also Porphyry's introduction. But you also get commentaries rather than on the uh, sentences of Peter Lombard, like all uh, medieval bachelors uh, did. By bachelors, I mean uh, those who have graduated from theological education and are studying to be a master. But all uh, medieval bachelors lectured on or commented on the sentences of Peter Lombard. But in this new era of the church, you had throughout the entire church commenting on the Summa of St. Thomas. So you have this line of thinkers uh, in the second scholastic period, who are known as the commentators. And then over time, uh, especially in the 18th century, uh, the seven, the early 17th century is kind of like the golden, the golden age, the hundred, basically the century after Trent was a golden age in theology. But by the 18th and a uh, little bit in the early 19th century, you have a little bit of a, uh, a stagnant um, period in theology. And then uh, in the 19th century, you get this uh, retrieval uh, that starts to happen with uh, what are called the collegio theologians. Uh, certain theologians like um, Cardinal Perone. If, if you ever, uh, if anybody knows, uh, he was the guy who actually trained St. John Henry Newman in Rome. Uh, Cardinal Perone, uh, Cardinal Frangelin, he's another example. Uh, guys like Sheban. Uh, Sheban's another example of one of these guys. I think he was taught by Perone. Mm -hmm. was, was she? Do you know if Sheban was taught by Perone or not? Um, he cites him a lot in his dogmatics, but I don't know if he was specifically, uh, like if he specifically sat under him or anything. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so you have this uh, this revival happening in the 19th century, and like with any sort of uh, revival movement, uh, obviously except the uh, the Baroque period because the Baroque period was perfect in every way. I'm joking, um, but. In the revival of the late 19th century, which eventually um, was, I guess you could say, crowned in its like golden period with uh, Pope Leo XIII and the work that he did uh, with the spreading of the philosophy and theology of St. Thomas, you had uh, in many different areas a certain, uh, uh, there was a sense that what was reached, the heights that were reached in the Baroque period were kind of, uh, there, there was kind of a falling, uh, there there wasn't as great, I guess you could say, of theologians during this period as there was in the Baroque period, is there was that sense uh, that was going around. So you had um, a lot of figures looking back uh, to this period. And Garrigou uh, specifically saw himself, and I, and I think this is what makes him unique, he specifically saw himself as um, an inheritor of that commentorial tradition. So not only would he um, teach their doctrine, like so many others uh, were doing, but he also wanted to do what they did. He wanted to um, he wanted to continue in their line of theology by actually acting like them, and then through that uh, also being like St. Thomas. So he is he's a, a figure who not only has a wonderful powers of exposition and following upon the tradition, he had access to all of St. Thomas's works, which were really cool. Um, a lot of generations didn't have access to all of his works, but only a limited amount of his corpus. So he was able to study directly and deeply the, the text of St. Thomas, along with what he had read from the commentorial tradition, 
from uh, some of the additions which were done during the Leonine uh, revival uh, era. So uh, Garrigou Lagrange, uh, French, French Thomist, he follows in that line. And he's, he's a, he has a very interesting, I guess you could say, charism. Because he really is a, um, a very, in a very odd way, he's a very strong replication in this era uh, amongst uh, other, other uh, theologians. Amongst other theologians, he, he really is a, uh, like a replica of St. Thomas. It's really, really uh, eerie, actually. You get him uh, being interested in much in the same things, acting in much of the same way. He was, he was a very um, simple man. He was, um, he was said to be a mystic. Uh, there's actually reports of him having uh, levitated before the, uh, while contemplating beatitude, uh, just like St. Thomas had, had levitated. He was frequent, uh, frequently in ecstasies. He wrote a lot about uh, mystical theology, and he also, um, he combined that to the scholastic element of his thought. So you have this long uh, tradition of Dominican uh, mystico-scholastics that Garrigou kind of stands at the end of. Um, which obviously we, we still have it uh, after Garrigou, but I'm, I'm talking about like the, the the greats, you know, the the ones who wrote the the um, the very popular uh, works. Because just like Saint Thomas, Garrigou not only wrote to the wise, Garrigou also wrote to the simple. It's actually said in the canonization trial of uh, of Saint Thomas Aquinas uh, by John the Twenty Second that. Uh, that St. Thomas, his works were loved not only by the wise, but also by the simple. Because St. Thomas is, uh, uh, William of uh, Toko calls it his simplicity of style. So he describes his simplicity of style. We don't think of him as simple, but he actually, relatively speaking, was quite simple. And the same with Garrigou. The reason Garrigou's works got translated into English, a lot of people don't know this. So if you ask yourself, okay, if Garrigou was this like egghead, you know, academic, who uh, didn't really have uh, much traction. Why were his works getting translated into English during his lifetime? The reason his works were getting translated into English during his lifetime is because he was so beloved by the Dominican tertiaries. So laymen who were interested in theology and wanted to read, they, they loved uh, his works so much. They loved it so much. So this is, this is really who Gary Gu uh, is. He's this really amazing figure who's covering everything from mystical theology to summa commentaries to philosophy to individual works on Mariology, providence, predestination. He has spiritual works, sermons. He he has he he wrote such a wide range of different works. He wrote a two volume work on God, a two volume work on mystical theology, and a two volume work on fundamental theology. It's it's insane. And then also beside that, he has an eighty page bibliography of journal articles. That's it. Just journal articles he had written. So that that's, I, I guess a um, kind of like as an intellectual and spiritual bi uh, bibliography of Gary Gu, um, that's well, biography of Gary. Gu, I guess that's the, that's the best we're going to get anything to add, Ethan. You're muted. Yeah. I uh, just, uh, on the, on your point about his, uh, simplicity, um i i was shocked when i read him for the first like the first time um, i think i read, read um predestination and i found it extremely easy to read i was i was very surprised. I thought I was going to um, find it harder to read than it was. Um, and and yet, while being easy to read, he doesn't, you know, it's not like he's losing anything. He's just how things unfold from there. Um, he's one of my favorites to just read if I I mean, even if I'm just, you know, have you know, a rough, rough day and, and stuff like that, it just gives you a nice um, just boost you right into contemplation, so to speak. 
boosts is kind of a funny so word, true, but yeah. hey, it works. So true. So true. Okay, so everybody's been everybody's been kind of asking. I guess we'll finally tell you guys about it. Uh, they they've been asking about what uh, fundamental theology. Is. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Rip. Okay, I'm gonna mute you for like a minute uh, while I get into the fundamental theology stuff to get your audio uh, recapped. Dang, is it letting me mute you? Oh no, Ethan Ethan has taken over the stream. It won't let me mute him. Rip. Okay, Can you hear me? So, um, Hello? Yeah, you're kind of off right now. Okay. Christian? It's such a, it's such a boomer moment right now for me. I can't figure out how to mute. Oh, no, rip. Okay. Um, you could, could you hear me? Um, not that well, actually, but enough. <laughs> GG, so true. It's over. They're trolling. Okay. Mute me. Okay. Oh, wait. Okay, so we're going to – oh, wait, he figured out how to mute himself. Okay, good. Okay, good. So uh, we're going to continue uh, right now. So what exactly is uh, fundamental theology? Because uh, I keep using this term, um, and a lot of people are confused. Uh, is fundamental theology just apologetics? Is it just a fancy form of philosophy? Uh, what is uh, fundamental theology? So um, when it comes to fundamental theology, fundamental theology uh, is described as, uh, this is by uh, Salaveri, who wrote the Sacred Theologia Summa. Very good work, by the way. Uh, he describes it as the quasi-bridge between philosophy and theology. It's a quasi bridge. So what fundamental theology does, it's it's properly a part of theology. It's not a part of philosophy. It's properly a part of theology. But what it does is it takes revelation. So we have this body of revelation from God. And it gives reasons why or certain motives why it, uh, this revelation is credible. So it gives, uh, it defends its own principles. That's what St. Thomas says. It defends its own principles. Because the highest science uh, defends its own principles. Um, so it's wrongly reduced to like some sort of apologetics. Because by apologetics, we think like, okay, we're, we're going to be defending the faith. We're going to be showing how these various propositions of the faith are contained in the deposit of revelation. That's not what it does. Rather, what it does is it shows uh, by way of miracles, by way of prophecies, by way of the completion uh, that we find uh, in the in the Catholic faith um, to human nature. Uh, that's a, a completion, perfection. Uh, I'm being loose with language right now. But through these means, we show the reasons why the revelation is credible. Because we can't properly prove, like we would, uh, for example, that... Um, I don't know, the powers of the soul are really distinct from the essence of the soul. We can properly prove that from scientific principles, but we can't prove revelation in that way um, because revelation is something which is above the domain, properly speaking, of, um, of the human intellect, something above the domain of the human intellect. So we can only give uh, sort of reasons of believability, I guess, if you want to put it like that, like why it's believable. And the, re the way in which we can show why something is believable is the same way in which Christ and the apostles uh, did it, by pointing to miracles, by pointing to prophecies, by pointing to these things that could not have been um, produced by men. So when it comes to fundamental theology, there's going to be three parts to fundamental theology. 
So uh, the first part is the uh, introduction to sacred theology. So in the introduction to sacred theology, uh, all we do there is we just show the um, the nature of theology, the divisions uh, within theology. Actually, some discuss the history of sacred theology. So that's that's what we that's what we do in that first part. And then from that, uh, we're going to discuss uh, De Revelazione. So De Revelazione is what's covered here, although uh, there's a brief introduction to sacred theology appendix to the front. But De Revelazione is on divine revelation. So we ask ourselves, what is revelation? Basically, it's what is revelation? Where is it found? Well, actually, never mind. Not where is it found. But what is revelation and why should we believe it? That's what De Revelazione is covering. That's what On Revelation is covering. Then the third part is De Locis. De Locis covers where is revelation to be found. So people were asking uh, before the uh, fun question of where is it? People were asking the fun questions about material sufficiency, uh, for example, or pardon, pardon. So that actually would be covered in De Locis. De Locis is this third part of fundamental theology. So De Revelazione doesn't cover um, in this book specifically De Revelazione on divine revelation. This doesn't specifically cover um, uh, sacred issues surrounding the, the fathers, sacred scripture, uh, basically the deposits of revelation or the channels or the sources of revelation, what uh, whatever language you want to use or the places of revelation or the fount of revelation. Whatever you want to use for where revelation is found and how we go from uh, how we go and take these points of revelation in order to make arguments that something is revealed. That is that is all um, part of Delochi. So we're not covering that uh, here. Rather, we're just covering what revelation is. So this is going to take us into fun questions surrounding nature and grace. Uh, and then we're also going to be uh, looking at the sort of why we should believe it. And then next to this is going to be some fun questions surrounding how the ascent of faith works. So you get questions all the time from people struggling with the certainty you can have about the faith, how the church relates uh, in her promulgation of the faith to the uh, causality that uh, God has of revelation. These are a lot of different questions that are just going to be covered in De Revelazione. And that's why this is two, uh, two thick, thick volumes. Um, De Revelazione, fantastic. So uh, when it comes to its sort of place within the tracts, so up to up to this point, once you hit De Revelazione, uh, what's assumed here, at least in the uh, traditional ordering, is you go through uh, first logic, then natural philosophy, then metaphysics, then ethics. That's your sort of philosophy up here. And then uh, after, uh, after, uh, fundamental theology. You're covering things like De Deo Uno, which covers the unity of God, De Deo Trino, um, on God the Creator, and then uh, your tracts on morals and blah, blah, blah. So the the place when it comes to uh, fundamental theology is it's going to bridge it. And it's going to bridge on both sides. So on the side of philosophy, it's going to tell philosophy the motives of credibility. So it's going to Go over to philosophy and tell philosophy, like, hey, here's why you should go beyond that and why you should go to this uh, higher order of the supernatural order of knowledge. And on the other hand, uh, it, it looks forward and grounds. That's why it's called fundamental. It grounds uh, all of sacred theology because it gives it um, the matter of theology. It gives it the, th the thing in which, uh, well, I guess the object of theology is actually the proper term. It gives it the object of, of theology, what it works with. Um, it also tells it its rules. It tells it uh, a bunch of different stuff. It's nature. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that De Revelazione, De Revelazione does for uh, theology as well. So it's really one of those uh, lost gems of the older way of doing theology. Right now you kind of have... Um, apologetics which is seen as something that internet people do and <laughs> rather than uh, people who are serious but no actually de revelazione is a very very important uh tract okay ethan says his connection is pretty solid now so ethan are you back with us 
I hope so. Does it does it seem like you can hear me better? Oh, you sound you sound a you sound a million times better. Oh, that's excellent. Very good news. Glad to be back. Yeah. So uh, I was just I was just talking about like the the nature of fundamental theology, where it fits, and such. The uh, what we discussed in De Revelazione. Uh, that's what I was going for. Excellent. Okay. Did you dive into the text at all, or just kind of? No, no, I wasn't. Uh, okay. Did you? If you wanted to dive into the introduction, uh, we can. But I wasn't planning on getting into the text at all. Sounds good. Let's just stay outside of it for now. So somebody asked, uh, "Are there any works one should read before getting into this book?" Actually, I think uh, the sense of mystery, um, also printed by Amaze Academic, um, would help a lot. Uh, I've I've just read that like within the last few weeks, um, and he. Um, breaks down a lot of things that are they're just very helpful to know. Like he works through um, a lot of the kind of um, philosophical precursors that are going to help you grasp um, some of the more difficult concepts in this book. So I think that's one you could go with, but I don't think it's strictly necessary if you're if you're familiar with like you know just the just the typical you know matter form the the four um, causes things like that. Yeah, I'm actually going to. Uh, I'm shilling another Emmaus book, um, Fenton's. Uh, what is it? <sighs> Laying the foundation. That's what they call it. They changed the name on the Emmaus version. Yeah, Laying the Foundation: A Handbook of Catholic Apologetics and Fundamental Theology. This is. Uh, I've always kind of seen this as like an easier version um, of De Revelatione. Uh, but the easiest version is a non-Emmaus one, but it's still a Minard one. A uh, Minard's on uh, Duranzo. Uh, I guess I'll send that one. Sorry, Emmaus. I have to give somebody else some love. Uh, who, who, who prints this one? Um, I've actually been reading this. Uh, Aru Aruka. Aruka Press. Yeah, I've been reading this recently. It's honestly one of my favorite books. Uh yeah, but this covers introduction to theology, revelation, channels of revelation, then the church. So like the first 250 pages, is basically like a super summarized version of the Revelazione. So if you want to like a little introduction to it before you get into Garrigue, which is like a big, very detailed introduction to it. then yeah, you can check that out. Yeah, but somebody asked, does fundamental theology belong under the domain of philosophy or is it a branch of dogmatic theology? Is systematic theology and dogmatic theology the same thing? And where does catechism fit in? Okay, this is this is some good questions. So fundamental theology, as I said, is a uh, it's not really a, a branch of dogmatic theology because branch would kind of assume that like that fundamental theology kind of plays by the same rules and follows from like the same sort of, it's just like another amongst many uh, when it comes to uh, what we're looking at, but it really grounds uh, the rest of um, theology. It's kind of like how mystical theology is the terminus um, of, of contemplation. So like we, we go up and, and around and we finally reach up the mystical theology, which is the, is the way in which the soul ought to ascend uh, from the contemplation of truth. So in a similar way, a uh, fundamental theology is kind of like that, that floor uh, that we have from where we like build uh, the rest of the building, uh, if you want to put it like that. So, yeah, but it belongs to dogmatic theology. The theologian as theologian uh, does fundamental theology, it doesn't just pretend to be a philosopher or anything. And then uh, systematic theology and dogmatic theology, um, it depends upon who you talk to uh, language wise. So, uh, systematic theology uh, generally is going to refer to something like scholastic theology, which is basically the um, the more we're going to get into this later uh, because there is a section on the introduction to theology, but it's the more precise definition. Um, so the investigation of revealed notions. So, for example, the word was made flesh uh, by flesh. We can more precisely define it as human nature, which we can define as rational animality. So the, the contemplation of uh, revealed notions and then also the scientific drawing from those notions of conclusions, the drawing of theological conclusions as well, um, is going to belong to um, systematic theology. Dogmatic theology, uh, some just mean all theology that discusses um, 
that those things which are of uh, faith rather than of morals. And then others uh, by dogmatic theology mean positive theology. So that would be the um, use of dialectical arguments uh, to provide the grounding of dogmas in the sources of revelation, uh, if you want to put it like that. Then where does catechism fit in? So catechism is like, actually the, the catechism, I don't know if you ever noticed this, Ethan. This is really interesting. The catechism actually has a section for De Revelazione in it. You know that? No, I didn't notice that. Yeah, if you if you look at the way in which the catechism is ordered, um, because Gary Gu makes this really cool comment in the beginning, uh, in the introduction, is that like all of theology kind of follows the Apostles' Creed, and he's like, okay, where mm -hmm. is where's fundamental theology in this? And he's like, fundamental theology is in the credo. So what it means what it means to say I believe, that's what fundamental mm -hmm. theology is. So the catechism actually has this section uh, where he talks to. Uh, where it talks about man's capacity for God, man's capacity for God. Oh, I never thought about it like that. And then, uh, That's God really helpful. To meet man, and then response to God. So this like first section, I believe, we believe. That's basically fundamental theology. Hmm. There's also yeah, it's about like the deposit of revelation, transmission of revelation, revelation itself. Yeah, so it's interesting because you get uh, even in. Uh, the current catechesis method of catechesis, you still get this uh, the same sort of ordering that we find in the in the schools. What is the name? What is the name of what? <laughs> oh, question. What is the name? <laughs> what is the name? Okay, um, I'm going to pull up actually. Uh, De Revelazione, real quick. I want to read the introduction now that I that I said the whole I believe thing. So I guess we will get into the text. Do you have your book on you? Yeah, I do. Because I have the digital version, which no, I can't see you. Is there still like a four second lag? I'm trying to figure this out. No, no. I think uh, I think we're good now. Oh, excellent. Splendid. I can just chip in with my little comments whenever I feel oh, like it. Now of the though. of the book. Um, it's the science of sacred theology by Manuel Duranzo, translated by Matthew K. Minard, who also translated De Revelazione. Um, okay, man, I was I was reading way past in some random place. Okay, man, I got to go through this whole introduction now to get to the place where I'm thinking. Yeah, the author's preface. Oh, this is so good. Every every single word that has ever been uh, that has ever written in De Revelazione is a good word. Mm -hmm. is this? Trying to figure out how to do this. This is such a boomer moment right now. Yeah, usually is with you. It's true. I I know I'm boomer. Mo I'm finding out how to share my screen. Jeez. I've been doing this for so long, and I still don't know how to share my screen. Of course, I'm uh, I'm the one calling you a boomer when I don't. I, I literally dropped out of the stream due to connection problems. <laughs> Dude, I'm I'm about to make the most boomer thing ever. I'm about to copy and paste the text and put it in a word document. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> share my screen. I can't figure out how to do this. I I don't know why. I don't know why it's like this. This is this is like, this, oh my! I am I am such a boomer right now. Did we not get you a PDF? No, you guys didn't give me a PDF. Oh, uh, oh wait. I mean, yes. I mean, uh, maybe. I mean, kind of. Uh, did have a PDF, maybe. I don't know. Um, don't ask incriminating questions, uh, Ethan. Okay, so yeah, this is the author. The author's preface. Very, very good stuff. So he's here going to be explaining. Oh, wait, I'm going to mute you real quick. Actually, mute yourself unless you want to talk. Because there's a little bit of feedback. Mm, okay. Okay. So the author's preface, this is just him kind of like going into what De Revelazione is about and why he wants to write it. It's really good. So this treatise on revelation proposed by the Catholic Church contains the whole of apologetics. Namely, the defense of the divine origin of Christianity and of the divine institution of the Catholic Church for preserving and infallibly proposing revelation. These two forms of defense were considered together by the third session of the First Vatican Council. 
Uh, thus, the apologetic part of the treatise on the church is connected with the treatise on revelation or on the true religion. However, this is not the place for considering the intimate constitution of the church, nor theological sources, locis theologicis, uh, both of which must be treated later on in the properly theological manner. So what's going on here, um, it's really important, is, uh, and this is what actually I think Garrigou is quite a master of, is ordering the, uh, is explaining and uh, going into the proper ordering of the theological treatises. It's just like fantastic how he does it. Um, because he, right here, he's correctly identifying. He's like, okay, what I want to do is I want to present revelation, why you ought to believe revelation, why it's divine. So this is going to get us into some topics which are going to um, surround, obviously, uh, the uh, the church, the church as um, said to be condition of revelation, the church as proposing revelation. But... But, um, sorry, River Run is is distracting me right now. But we don't treat the church in its intimate, intimate constitution. So we don't treat the church um, in, for example, uh, if we wanted to ask the question of like how the, the bishops relate to the Roman pontiff. De Revelazione wouldn't be a place for that. De Revelazione would be a place for uh, discussing, for example, the, the marks of the church, which are the, um, the signs that we can look to in the church um, to where we know that it's, it is of divine origin. So we're very clear. We're different. We're looking at different aspects of different things, but always under the same light and uh river run um, to get, to get Wagner some live stream training. I know I'm, I'm so, I'm so bad. I'm so bad at it. But uh, Ethan, do you have anything to say about that? Um, no, not, not a whole lot. Um, it's pretty straightforward stuff. Yeah, namely by arguing from revelation itself already infallibly proposed by the Catholic Church. So every other, uh, this is super important, so every other tract on theology is going to presuppose de revelatione. Because it's going to assume that uh, we've already um, shown that revelation, uh, that it is credible that revelation uh, is infallibly proposed by the Catholic Church. So from that position... So, nay, the treatise on the intimate constitution of the church logically ought to be treated after the treatise on the incarnate word and redeemer following the rightful ordering of the, uh, the apostolic creed. Although for the sake of convenience, in order to avoid repetition, the exposition of the constitution may be placed after the apologetic proof of the church's divine authority. Uh, yeah, so uh, everybody's wrong. Um, if you if you truly want to look at where ecclesiology ought to be treated, it's after um, the tractal on the divine word so saint thomas was to write a treatise on ecclesiology if he would have if he would have wrote a tract on ecclesiology in the summa he would have gotten it right after uh right after the incarnation some people would try to place it in the front i don't like that gary goose says it's apparently acceptable i guess i'll listen to him so in this book apologetics is not considered as being a science specifically distinct from sacred theology but rather it is held to be one of its particular offices it's an office of sacred theology, one that is rational and defensive. For apologetics does indeed argue from reason, although under the direction of faith, as we will explain more fully in the prologue below. Hence, this work is conceived as being a work on fundamental theology, that is, theology considered with the foundations of faith, or to put it another way, as a critical reflection on the, on the value of supernatural knowledge of faith. This is actually um, Sheban. This is really interesting. You might be drawing from Sheban here, actually. Um, because Sheban, when he when he talks about uh, his version of De Revelatione, it's really like supernatural epistemology is kind of how he views it. It's really interesting. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, helpful. I, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I, th I feel like Garrigou, at least, uh, from... Yeah, I know STS. I, I was very, I'm very disappointed uh, in the STS uh, that it that it places it where it does. But that was really common in the manuals, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, when when it comes to uh, Garrigou's treatment, it's a lot less uh, individual, I guess, if you want to put it like that. It's a lot more, uh, a lot more corporate. Um, 
I, I think, or universal, I guess you could say. But like Sheban is kind of like digging around in like the brain of somebody. Like I guess it's the best way of putting Sheban. Sheban's like digging around in the brain and heart of people, like while he's writing, and like uh, he's, he's being like very like it's almost uncomfortable reading him how he's just like peering into the depths of your soul but like gary <laughs> was just like looking at like things from like ten thousand feet above and like giving you really good universal principles i find i find gary much easier to read for that reason and then it, i'd almost say read him before you read uh Sheban, as, as that's how we want to say it um he's just easier to uh grasp i think and then it's, it makes it much easier when you go to read his works after you've read um Sheban said as after you read gary Mm. yeah so he uh he continues however in order for fundamental theology to be complete it must include not only the whole of apologetics but also the treatise on theological sources and it's de locis and it's also called fontibus theologicis um actually i've heard it uh fontibus revelation uh de fontibus revelationes but uh I guess it's also there. There's like 10 different names for each one of these treatises, especially on sacred scripture, divine tradition, the magisterium of the church, because what you have uh, with fundamental theology is fundamental theology just lets you know revelation right here. De locis, here are the sources you go to uh, because the terminus, it's really interesting because the terminus of um, uh, De Revelatione is you're looking at the um, the preaching the preaching of revelation by the Catholic Church. It's really important. Is there's a unity uh, to um, revelation is proposed? It's the preaching of the Catholic faith by the Catholic Church is divine in origin, because the Church stands there as uh, said to be the condition of revelation. So you can't you can't uh, so. You can't kind of graft De Revelazione. Uh, I actually asked a professor one time who uh, had is um, is well read in Garrigou uh, in his, in this uh, work by Garrigou, and I asked him like, "Hey, do do Protestants like kind of have a De Revelazione?" And they don't, and they really wouldn't be able to go off of our versions of De Revelazione because De Re- our the terminus of our proof, um, our apologetic proof, is uh, is revelation as preached by the catholic church which is why um you're you're really going to find no other work like this no other religion is going to have anything like de revelazione the catholic religion is the only one who's able to uh, defend herself in this way it's really really um it's really really cool actually and i and i think as i've studied de revelazione more and more I've studied through a, a few different authors, the way in which they put things, the way in which they organize things and express the proofs of things. And it's just uh, it just makes me uh, more and more sure in like a subjective sense, because obviously faith uh, is objectively certain of its of its object. But like in, in a sort of, I guess you could say, sense of affections, um, just extremely uh, certain in that sense, uh, in in the fact that, yeah, we're we're the we're, we're the real deal. Like the Catholic Church is the real deal. We we have like two volumes explaining um, what what revelation is and what are the motives of credibility for believing it. And nobody else really has anything uh, when it comes to motives of credibility. And it's uh, it's pretty sad, actually. And I, and I think there's and I actually think there's a lot of reasons for this. You good? Me? Yeah, I was just wondering. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, why did feedback come through or something? Nope, nope. I was oh, just that, right. that seemed like something you would wanna you would wanna harp on. Oh no, yeah. No, I guess I just didn't have anything for you there. I, uh, yeah, there's that. like no no Protestant version of De Revelazione. Like, I know, yeah. I, like I, 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 I was kind of caught up in thinking about that actually, I think is what happened there. Um I, pro- I was wondering pro- like pro- why it, it just because it lacks the like like why exactly yeah why exactly is that um because you'd think we could they could have some kind of discussion about well i mean i guess just the their their definitions of faith um and not properly distinguishing between um nature and grace would make it very difficult for them to even arrive at that concept yeah because i i feel like um it also comes down with a a weird 
sort of like quasi ontologism that infected a lot of early Protestant, well, infected some schools of early Protestantism and ended up in like Fantilianism mm -hmm. um, way, way down the way down the line. I think I think the reason for this is because there's not an adequate distinction between philosophy and theology. Yeah, and because of this less than adequate distinction between nature and grace, uh, what you have is you basically don't really need a fundamental theology, um, which is going to give certain motives of credibility for revelation, because your theology can almost become like a, or at least philosophy can just become like a kind of cute little precursor to theology, and theology can follow follow upon it like more or less naturally. And you don't really need these uh, motives of credibility. You can kind of like keep acting like uh, nothing happened, except you have like your sectional prolegomena, which kind of give you, gives you the rules that you already kind of have from logic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think it ends up becoming like a, uh, a souped up uh, natural philosophy is basically what mm -hmm. theology ends up becoming um, within the uh, within the Protestant world. Yeah, so, like there's just such a clarity in the in the in the definition Scaragu gives that is just mm -hmm. it's not there in the in the in the Protestant scholastics. I mean, I just remember when we were even looking at Junius, it was like this is a hundred times clearer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we were reading Franciscus Junius. Uh, he's a he's a Protestant scholastic from what what is he like late 16th century, early 17th century, somewhere around there. Yeah, but but Junius. Um, you, you like read the type of uh, definitions and distinctions he giving. It, it's way, way, way less intuitive than Gary Goo. And I think uh, somebody once asked me like, hey, why like why should I become like Catholic? And uh, and I knew they were very interested in theology. And I'm just like, look, just look at like just grab De Revelazione. Well, actually, just grab like the STS, the Sacred Theologiae Summa. Um written by some jesuits in the 50s and just like look like read like five pages of that on like an issue you disagree with agree with whatever it may be and tell me that you have produced something like that tell tell me like w at least like one of your thinkers who has written like an entire book that is that is as erudite as like five pages of the sts it it, it can't really be done um just because of uh, the the just, just the very um, providential and proper ordering of the theological treatises that happened uh, within Catholicism that gave us the gift of De Revelatione, something that nobody else has. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Somebody's asking why are motives of credibility no longer used in apologetics? Well, it's, I think it's because apologetics isn't actually done anymore as like a proper uh, science, really. Um, I mean, do you, do you ever hear anybody like when they uh, actually like two or three weeks ago, I was in a discord server and um, there was a very uh, intelligent uh, Muslim, a well, former Muslim who basically like was, was like, OK, I I don't really believe in Islam anymore. I'm kind of like at an, at an, at an, a time where I'm a classical theist, but I'm not really sure what God wants me to believe, uh, whether there is some sort of revelation uh, out there. And we actually get, get into this a little bit more uh, in De Revelazione, how this works. But you basically had this situation uh, where a lot of people would, um, would not really know what to do. Like, okay, we have this guy. Uh, he's a he believes in God. He knows he wants to look to see whether God calls him any place uh, by revelation. And I was like, okay, well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this like motives of credibility stuff with you. So um, here are the various different motives of credibility. Uh, here are uh, the various classes of miracles. Uh, that's really interesting. We'll classify miracles and show. Um, through philosophy why certain miracles have to be from god then also we can uh, have a certain moral certainty 
um, basically that God wouldn't deceive us in the way in which he has. So we can look at his various miracles. We can look at the historical attestation. Like we can be very sure, for example, about the miracles of, uh, I don't know, St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, uh, for example. We have uh, at, we can be more sure of St. Thomas's miracles than like certain murderers murdered people just because we have cross-examination of witnesses. We have evidence that was presented at trials. We can be very sure about these different uh, miracles that, that serve as motives of credibility uh, for the Catholic faith. And talked to this guy, went through this, and he was basically like, you know, that actually like really makes sense. I th I think I think that like uh, the divine stamp of credibility is on the Catholic faith. Now that that's like sort of the um, the like the power, I guess you could say, of of uh, something like De Revelazione is De Revelazione is going to show you uh, what we do kind of with somebody who is now has some sort of doubt about their current religious state and wants to inquire into the Catholic faith rather than doing uh, it's something you said to me, actually, Ethan, uh, that's always stuck with me. Um, you didn't know that, that you were actually saying that it's in De Revelazione. I don't think you knew that it's like st staying in fundamental theology, broadly speaking, but you said like at about the beginning of when we started inquiring into the Catholic faith, you're like, it's all about prolegomena. It's all about like these first things about how we ground the rest of theology. This is where it's all going to stay. And, uh, now we know it's really all about fundamental theology. And if, uh, if we can get people reading and studying fundamental theology and looking more into it. That that would uh, that would bring about a lot of fruit in the way in which people do theology, and also the way in which people do apologetics. No, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I think um, I was I was thinking about it as you were talking there. I mean, first the first thing when you were talking about um, how apologetics isn't really done anymore, um, there is a distinction. I can't remember where it's made. I know um, Dr. Mitter put a footnote and everything on it, but um, but he, where. He, he distinguishes between um, like the defense of one particular topic in theology and apologetics itself as a science. Mm -hmm. um, like we, that's what we, that's what, that's what apologetics is online. Like we call it apologetics, but it's really just like treating one particular subject. Um, what doesn't really, um, it doesn't really always help since a lot of those things presuppose faith to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um and so, especially for arguing with people who don't grant, you know, that, that God speaks to men, um, you're not yeah. going to get anywhere. Um, secondly, um, on, on what you were saying about me making the comment about it's all, it all being about uh, prolegomena, yeah, I mean, I think any um, convert is going to recognize while reading this book that this was the process that they went through. Mm -hmm. um, in a very real way, like um, seeing, you know, signs, miracles, um, and then it all culminates, I'd say, for every convert I've talked to in recognizing the uh, miraculous life of the church. Um, and seeing all of that together, um, it just creates this beautiful, um, yeah, like, it's just beautiful. It stands out um, in such a way that you recognize it's not a merely human thing. Yeah, um, it, it was it was like su it's super eerie uh when you're a convert who like was because i mean both of us were kind of very self-reflexive about our own conversion about the own affections of our souls and the um and the way in which we uh progressed in into like catholicism and having having that sort of experience and thinking about it a lot and talking to people about it a lot and then reading something like De Revelazione and then having just like when he talks about like the way in which conversion sort of happens, he's just like putting before like your eyes exactly what happened with you. And it's just like, huh, that's like real. It's like eerie uh, almost. Yeah, it was it was. Uh, yeah, it was um, like shocking to read and recognize that he was putting in a system what what had happened mm -hmm. um, like concretely in life, you know? Okay. So I'm going to continue on in the introduction. So hence uh, we've given the following title, fundamental theology, apologetic part. We added according to St. Thomas's doctrine based because the texts of St. Thomas pertaining to the matter at hand are carefully chosen and ex uh, explained for each question at hand. In this way, one will have a true introduction to the study of St. Thomas Aquinas's summa theologiae. I actually didn't pick up this part uh, on, on like my first like three readings is that he did mean this to be like an introduction to reading the Summa as well. That's really interesting. Did you notice that? 
I did know. not notice that. I I swear I read like this author's preface no, like four times. Original? I know I read that preface so many times. Is that in the, is <laughs> in the original? How did neither of us notice this? We're so bad. We're terrible. Well, that, that we makes a lot more sense of why when I go back and read the Summa, I can make a lot more sense of like where it's coming from. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This. This. Yeah. Because Saint Thomas didn't have like really a uh, proper fundamental theology um, treatise. He treats miracles, which kind of cover uh, something similar. Um, but yeah, here is here is uh, basically Garrigou writing for Saint Thomas a uh, fundamental theology manual, just as Saint Thomas would have. But uh, in this, our critique of the value of supernatural knowledge of faith, especially in the speculative part of the work, will develop its arguments in opposition to philosophical rationalism. This is going to be really, really interesting, uh, actually, because um, this was this was something I felt like a bit of bit of like a fish out of water uh, reading is reading all of the stuff of him critiquing uh, certain uh, continental philosophers. So. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to uh, be very judicious uh, with my exposition of those parts. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think while, while it, while it may, uh, there, there's always like the critique of like, Oh, this or that thinker, like straw man, this straw man, that like, blah, 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 blah. Um, who cares, honestly. Uh, but really, really who cares? Because it's um, because really uh, as St. Thomas teaches uh, error is meant uh, to present the truth to us in a uh in a clearer manner so who cares if saint thomas uh was misrepresenting kant because whatever bastardized version of kant he happened to present to us uh still uh, is able to help us contemplate the truth um because that's really what errors meant just like i don't care about the whole like was nestorius and nestorian or was uh you Eutychius, uh, Eutychian, or uh, whoever. I, I, I don't really care about those questions because really um, the error is actually help, uh, helping us be able to provide the, the truth of golden mean, as, as Garrigou calls it. Well, so this, is it like a, this is a warning right there that we don't really care about being accurate you know, with other people. <laughs> I don't know. If, that, if, that's your, if, that's your only, if your only goal is to get to, is to show, you know, what is true, then in a certain yeah. sense it doesn't matter. But um, in, in another, like, you know, we really need to treat those guys as like people, you know, mm. um, and consider their actual um, thoughts and think about what what do they actually mean and argue against them on their own terms. Um, yeah, it's just it's, it's just it just depends on the end we're you know seeking. Are we seeking mm. to argue with Kant or are we seeking to explain you know the treatise on uh, on divine revelation? Um, we're yeah, not really I, seeking to do the latter here, at least maybe in maybe somewhere else some time in the future i think what's uh what's really 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 important is recognizing that when he says kant he means kantians uh and when he says like descartes he means cartesians and so on. yeah uh because really what you have is a lot of these the original thinkers present um they are much more brilliant than they're that's why like I don't like criticizing some of the uh, like original Nouvelle Theologie guys because I think they were very brilliant. Uh, obviously, I, I know that there were some um, more radical guys who fell under Garrigou's wrath very rightly. Um, but there's other there are others guys who are a lot more moderate, uh, very brilliant. Um, so, it's, so it's hard to be like very harsh with them. Uh, but on the other hand, their followers. <laughs> you usually don't reach like the same level of uh, brilliance. So when we speak about like the new, when we speak about like the De Lubakians, for example, um, we're, we're speaking about a very different group of people than like De Lubak himself or, or like the, uh, um, I can't think of another example, but ba yeah, basically when it comes to dealing with um, like Kant, he really means the Kantians. He means those who follow Kant and what they're kind of uh, saying about what Kant uh, says. Okay, so um, continuing uh, this so because lengthier arguments against biblical rationalism by right fall into an introduction of, to sacred scripture next Jesus. Therefore, to accomplish our own end here, we will treat at length of the notions of revelation, mysteries, dogmas, and supernaturality of faith, and the notion of credibility by comparing Catholic notion of all these various matters with heterodox notions of them. 
Some readers will perhaps think that our treatment is longer than is necessary for beginners. Nevertheless, in the course of teaching this subject for eight years, we have noticed nearly all students, especially the most talented of them, need all these explanations for the resolution of naturalist uh, thinkers' objections. This is going to be actually really fun because we're going to be looking at naturalism. Uh, Gary Goo is going to be looking at the best possible uh, objections to um, the idea of, of faith, the idea of supernatural revelation. He's going to be resolving them. He's going to be looking to uh, notions of revelation, mysteries, dogma, uh, supernatural identity, faith, etc., which today especially are concerned with the very foundations of faith and are cited by all. In addition, we wanted to pay heed to what would be useful for students and even for professors by making clear how the foundations that we treat herein are connected with the various problems of theology. Among the questions occurring in the treatise uh, on Revelation, one of the greatest importance, how is Revelation to be recognized as the formal motive of infused faith? So this is this is actually like something which I think uh, is really going to be central uh, to resolving a lot of people's uh, intellectual vices uh, when it comes to theology. Is that the for like why we um, like for example, if you ask me why I believe in the resurrection, what, what's what's the right answer for why you believe in the resurrection, Ethan? Let's see if you can get it right. Um, you believe in the resurrection because of the authority of God who reveals. Boom. Boom. Why do you believe in the resurrection? Some people are like, well, I believe in the resurrection because I did this, this history, blah, 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 blah. No, no. You don't believe in the resurrection because uh, of some accidental chain of historical passing downs or whatever. You believe in the resurrection because God revealed it. If something is on the motive of anything less than God revealing, then it's not truly faith. This is super, super, super important. Um, for resolving a lot of people's uh, objections. Uh, the formal motive of infused faith is the authority of God revealing. Uh, this problem is the same as questions concerning the ultimate resolution of supernatural certitude of faith. So how does certainty work? Which is commonly set forth in the treatise on faith. However, many other contemporary authors uh, settled these matters immediately after their lectures on Revelation, the church, and the theological sources, doing so before their lectures on the one and triune God. By contrast, according to the tradition of the scholastics, the true location of the treatise on faith was placed by St. Thomas at the beginning of Secunda Secundae in the Summa Theologiae, after the questions on grace, and before the articles on hope, charity, and the other virtues. Now, here in the treatise on Revelation, treating of its knowability, as well as of the credibility of the mysteries of faith, we will inquire into how revelation may be known, not only from an external perspective, inasmuch as it is confirmed in an utterly certain manner by naturally knowable miracles, but moreover, from the intimate and most lofty perspective, namely, uh, in, inasmuch as it is the formal motive of infused faith. Thus, we will explain, and this is what I was thinking of, actually. Thus, we will explain, as all to be done in fundamental theology, the first words of the apostolic creed, I believe. So this is what we treat, I believe. However, in order uh, to resolve this important question, we will at length set forth the opinions of various theologians, especially those of St. Thomas and his disciples, concerning the grace needed for the beginning of faith, as well as for adhering to its formal motive. According to these illustrious authors, supernatural faith is not discursive, and is not formally and intrinsically founded on natural certitude regarding the fact of revelation known on the basis of miracles, but instead is founded on supernatural revelation itself. What does this mean? The motives of credibility, they don't somehow become the motive for our sense of faith. Rather, the motive for our sense of faith is always um, supernatural revelation. This that is would be, be Pelagianism. Like, exactly, exactly. This is what we're all like this entire treatise. It's kind of funny. What we're always trying to stop ourselves from doing is becoming Pelagians. <laughs> always. That's just been Christian and I's entire life. <laughs> you know, when we were, uh, when we were reformed, we used to think that Pelagianism was just like, um, was merely like denying the effects of sin. It's yeah. Crazy. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. We or like, we or like so any, silly. or like any kind of movement, um, like of the will apart from God, um, which we didn't even distinguish between nature and grace well enough either. Like you can have God being the one moving nature to its ends and yet still be a Pelagian. 
uh, because you don't have supernatural grace involved as yeah exactly because and that's Pelagius, that's the other thing like Pelagius is not yeah. denying the elevation of grace where they were just like oh you have some sort of like motion divine motion present in nature um it, it was like it was really really weird because they like substituted um like basically what 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 you had is like in the catholic view you kind of are like here in nature and then like grace kind of takes you onto like a whole new dimension but with them they're thinking about like okay okay we have nature right here fall into sin makes nature worse and then you have grace which brings us like slightly above nature but we're like still in the same domain you know like catholics are just like okay we have nature going here and then it's just like grace takes us completely off of the charts you know takes us to a completely new dimension Mm -hmm. because grace uh grace is going to be a a participation in the supernatural life it's not going to be anything which is even credible like god couldn't create um a creature to which nature to which grace would be natural to it so good if you want to read anything on this guys read uh the glories of divine grace by uh Sheevan, just you will cry reading it. It's so good. It's true. <laughs> true. You know what? You know what makes me sad though. What? Uh, but we're about to have one of our many uh, Scotus trolling moments. Um, but uh, oh, Sco- Scotus, Scotus thinks that uh, God create could create a creature to which um, Grace was natural to it. Boo. 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 Yeah, but uh, that's actually something we'll be covering later. That's fun. Um, But now we've got to cover the boring introduction. But which, under the uh, infused light of faith, that by which what is believed is believed, and that which is believed, or that which is entrusted to the mysteries. Indeed, the apologetic demonstration concerning the rational credibility of revelation has the character of being only a support or a disposition of an inferior order for the supernatural act of faith. So this is important to remember because a lot of you might have heard what we've said so far and be like, okay, so if we can like prove that these miracles happen, then we can get people to like assent to the faith, right? Is that how it works? No. No. You're being a Pelagian. All of you are Pelagian. <laughs> Pelagianism is, is no, that's not how it works. Rather, I think we need a shirt for that. All of you are yeah, Pelagians with, all with of you, you pointing. Are Pelagians. Just like uh, we, we, Sheevan on there. I think we have to screenshot that exact moment and put it on a t-shirt. It's true. It's true. All of your Pelagians, <laughs> every single last one of you. Because it is the motives of credibility, they do not they do not like elicit somehow the act of faith. They don't bring it about. They are a support. They dispose in an inferior order uh, for the supernatural act of faith. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, this is about to be the worst illustration ever, but I don't care. Um, it's kind of like how when I make coffee, do you know what a mocha pot is? No. No. Well, oh wait, actually, I need to solve this real quick. Uh, he says miracles do not compel faith because faith is free. Um, also because miracles are actually something which still are not intrinsically supernatural, but only motively, uh, modally supernatural. Faith is far superior to miracles. That's true. But uh, a mocha pot is this contraption, I guess you could say, for making espresso. You like you, you put it on your stove and then you like warm it up beneath and the espresso actually like comes out on top. But you add water to the bottom. And what I found out is is a good practice is you are supposed to um, warm up, like boil the water and then put boiling water in the bottom and then warm it up. So like quickly uh, comes out rather than having mm. to have the water warm up and everything. So basically the, the motives of credibility is the difference having the motives of credibility versus not having the motives of credibility. Um, and this, uh, this analogy is going to fall short, uh, but it's basically the difference between like having putting the cold water in and putting the warm water in. No matter if it's cold or warm, it's still not going to make coffee. You still you still need to put the coffee grounds in up there, and you still need to warm up the bottom and have it go through. It's not going to make coffee just by warming up the water. Rather, it's going to dispose the water in in the disposition of an inferior order towards the making of the coffee. This is yeah. This is such a you example right here. Um, it, just taking it, something it, it from fits, your it no, it, it it fits it fits, but but so does um. So does like you know, 
me going and going and uh, cleaning up a crime scene in and uh, scraping all of the blood. And uh, yeah, you, you didn't explain the fact that you work in crime scene cleanup. So to be fair, this is a really <laughs> oh, weird, fair enough. This is a fair really enough. weird comment. Yes. Right okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. I, I I work in I work in crime scene cleanup. So we go in and you know if there's blood all over the ground. We clean it up and rub up the floor and everything like that. Um, it, it's it, it's a similar thing. It's like hey, somebody's got to live here. You can't just have them move in if there's a bunch of blood on the floor you know you kind of have to remove it and um put the rest of everything else in order before somebody else can come in and live there but i think the best example we could give here is just the one jesus gives with you know the parable of the sower um there's several um seeds that are planted in different places some land on rocks some land on you know um in thorny areas others land on well-tilled ground um so the 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 matter or like the lower thing is disposed to receive the form or the act, which is like the seed thrown on the ground that is made for the seed and the seed can grow there. Um, I think that's a good example of what we're trying to do in apologetics, not um, give people faith, but just clear the way so that they yeah. can make the act so they can, you know, receive grace. Yeah. St. Paul, he, he makes a similar comment when he's like, uh, I have I have uh, planted and then Apollo has watered, but God gives the growth. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Like the, exactly. the, the motives of credibility is the planting and watering, but without the uh, without the motion of God to bring about the growth in plants, we're not going to get any plants out of it. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a real sense in which yeah, like the preacher needs to know, or the the you know the one going out and converting people. Why don't I have the term missionary? Um, needs to have needs to know this stuff inside and out because they're going to run into people who don't have faith. Okay. So continuing, some theologians will perhaps be surprised at our insistence upon the importance of this chapter of doctrine. We're not. Nevertheless, we believe it is absolutely necessary that there be a defense of the essential supernaturality of infused faith which requires a formal motive exceeding that of natural faith, such as is found, for example, in the demons. Yeah, so if you have a, if you have a natural motive uh, for natural faith in God, you have the faith of the demons. A motive, I say, which a uh, fortiori exceeds that of the opinion that a formal heretic can preserve concerning the truth of the mystery of the Incarnation. Indeed, St. Thomas says, the species of any given habitus depends on the formal character of its object, without which the species of the habitus cannot remain. Now, the formal object or motive of faith is the first truth, as manifested in the sacred scriptures in the church's doctrine, which proceeds from the first truth. And therefore, whoever fails in achieving this means is totally lacking in the faith. This is super important as well. And it's like everything he says is super important. Because when, when it comes to wow. uh, when it comes to certain uh, acts and habits, they're formally specified by their object, by their formal object. So that's why, uh, for example, we can't have um, a certain angel that's created with natural um, the natural beatific vision, because the beatific vision has um, an a, an object that's essentially supernatural, formal object that's essentially supernatural. So an order meaning, that, meaning that it pertains specifically to God's knowledge of himself. Exactly. Right. So like unless the angel um, was infinite, eternal being of itself, then um, then it could not have that that knowledge by nature. This is exactly why we're going to we're going to rag on SCOTUS a lot here mm -hmm. yeah, on exactly this particular right. issue, um, because he, he he makes it depend on the will of God. Um, that um, that the angel wouldn't be able to have beatific vision by its na by its nature. For example, we're going to say it's it's necessary because it's just simply a metaphysically impossible that that, that it would be the case. Um, exactly. So, so this is why when it comes I've, to faith, that's not to say to SCOTUS faith. is like awful, but you know, uh, well, on this issue, it's yourself. pretty awful. Speak for yourself. Uh, on this um, issue, at least. <laughs> well, what, when, it, when it comes to when it comes to like the ascent of faith, this is why we need a supernatural light supernatural object first truth god under the formal aspect of his uh, deity is the formal object of the ascent of faith it has to be supernatural all around because if it fails in any one aspect it's going to be natural um so the formal motive can't be something natural it can't be um the 
uh, motives of credibility. They're, they merely dispose us. It has to be uh, God revealing, which is why our intellects, by grace, need to be raised up um, beyond uh, its exigencies. It needs to be raised up beyond um, its, its normal sort of powers and abilities, if you want to put it like that. So uh, this chapter concerning the mode of our knowledge of revelation, as it is the formal motive of infused faith, will perhaps be more difficult for students beginning a course of studies in sacred theology. However, for their greater benefit, we will summarize it more clearly in a concluding section so that they will not need to re uh, read through these things that are set forth in smaller typeset concerning the matter. Yeah, sorry, uh, we're, we're not going to be reading through all the smaller typeset stuff or this this series would take us like five years. Um. <laughs> we're definitely going to dive into it at some points, but most of the time we're just going to go through the big text. Yeah, we'll just summarize. Later on in the course of their theological studies, they will perceive the importance of this conclusion. Generally speaking, fundamental theology is difficult enough if it is treated deeply and integrally. Indeed, we find ourselves here concerned with the remote and proximate foundations of the supernatural certitude of faith. So that's what it's all about. And therefore, it is not surprising if all these matters are thoroughly understood only after a complete study of sacred theology, even though they are necessary for an initial understanding of the subject, at least in an elementary manner. This is actually really cool. And I, I actually kind of get this um, is basically what you need. Is you kind of need like a two fold approach um, to in fundamental theology is always going to be like this is. Um, I've read simpler, easier introductions um, to fundamental theology like Duranzo or like um, Fenton or even somebody mentioned earlier, Woodbury also wrote one that I've read. So needing, needing, or, and then obviously Dara Valachione as well. And then the STS one as well. Um, but reading these, uh, reading these sections on fundamental theology at once, you're going to, it's going to help just introduce all of theology for you. But eventually, as like I read more stuff, I find myself going back to fundamental theology and maybe like picking up Gary and being like, OK, well, I remember he discussed this in one place in a very important way that I think is going to affect this. Uh, for example, I've been reading some stuff about um, the uh, whether Christ would have become incarnate had man not fallen. That has all to do with fundamental theology, actually. And I think it exposes um, a lot of the scotistic weakness. Um, in fundamental theology, uh, the, the answer that uh, the Scotus and the Suarezians gave. But like literally, it's just everything, all roads lead back to fundamental theology. This is very important. So this isn't going to just be like a one time sort of read or series or whatever. This is going to be a book you're going to buy and then constantly go back to over and over again. Okay, so uh, hence the study of fundamental theology can be profitably taken up again at the end of the course of sacred theology. And in this way, one can thereby undertake a critical reflection after having direct knowledge of theology. In fact, we gave these lectures, De Revelazione, in accord with the scholastic program of studies through several years in two forms, namely in an elementary fashion for beginning students, uh, though in a more rigorous and detailed form in a course for students in the more advanced studies. Therefore, note well that we have written out in smaller type those things that are not necessary for beginners, although they nevertheless are for the use of the more diligent readers. We have divided the whole treatise into two books, the first of which is concerned with the possibility, befittingness, and knowability of revelation. So the, the first part is really going to be like the kind of theoretical part, where we're going to be discussing like, what revelation is, why we can know it, why it was fitting, uh, everything like that. And the second part, we're actually going to go and we're going to apply it when we look at um, the evidences or the the really the uh, the different evidences that fit into the different categories, of the motives of credibility. With the exception of the final section of the book, the first book is contained in the first volume. This final section, which is uh, concerned with the values and motive of credibility, especially concerning the value of miracles, is found along with book two in the second volume. As regards our use of Latin in writing the text, we often use scholastic expressions, which are of the greatest use in understanding theological concepts, although they are not conducive to elegant prose. Then he thanks somebody. So, yeah, that's that's the whole uh, introduction. 
and these are uh these are just random um footnotes but yeah that's the whole the whole uh introduction right there anything else to say ethan i'm thinking i wanna i wanna go to sleep here soon yeah i'm thinking i'm thinking the same but um yeah we're, we're gonna have a blast with this with this it's, series it's, um it's, sleep, it's sleepy time though. Uh, there's there's a lot there's a lot we're gonna cover um and not nearly in as much detail as we would like um <laughs> i'm quite sure but yeah at the same time um this is extremely important stuff and i can tell you this this stuff from this work has come up in christian and I's conversations for the last yeah pretty much the last two years even before we read the book we were talking about and you know working through a lot of issues that we didn't even know were here so yeah. um well we knew there were issues we just didn't know where to find answers to this and then we read their evolution and we we're like okay all of our all of our questions are answered now yeah yeah pretty much i mean this book is the these yeah this massive work is uh probably been the main thing i've reflected on for the last several months so yeah um, so this uh so um next time we're actually going to be getting into the uh the state of the question uh i don't know actually yeah we'll get into the state of the question so we're going to be getting into a little bit more about specifically uh what the state of the question is uh for fundamental theology and then into the nature of sacred theology in general so um, there's going to be three, there's three articles that definition of sacred theology, division and unity of sacred theology, and the methodology of sacred theology. So, um, that's going to be some really fun stuff. Oh, it's so good. I'm excited to get into it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> buy book or get, if you buy the book, uh, use, use the link below, uh, because that's an affiliate link and I will get like a bajillion percent. I'll get like a bajillion dollars for each volume because they're $60 a volume, so. Okay, so thank you everybody. Uh, goodbye and God bless.